Hello everyone. Well, I am here to review a surprise album that none of us saw coming, and this isn't the first one she's released this year, Taylor Swift's ninth studio album, Evermore. This album is following only about five months after Folklore came out in July of this past summer. This is, as Taylor dubs, the sister record to Folklore. It's sort of the companion album that she felt compelled to create after creating Folklore because of this global pandemic, not being able to do stadium tours and, you know, do the same regularly scheduled music industry programming, uh, so to speak, um, focusing on just making songs for the pleasure of it, exploring and seeing what could become. And Evermore was a continuation of that in that she felt she calls it the folklorian woods that she had entered into on her last album and wanting to further explore and resolve some of the ideas and uh, stories that she wanted to tell. She really actually has stated in recent interviews that she feels that Evermore was a sort of catharsis for her. This project really needed to come along with folklore. I think she has officially quelled any rumors of a third companion album to uh, these little surprise projects, although I wouldn't call them little by any means. There are 15 tracks each with also bonus tracks tacked on as well. Um, she's pretty much quelled those rumors. People were thinking that there was going to be another album called Woodvale, as uh, Woodvale is the name of the area in the Lake District in the UK that Taylor and her partner, boyfriend Joe Alwyn, loved to visit. They wrote a song, she wrote a song about it called The Lakes on Folklore. People think because it was written in like some Instagram post, the same way that Evermore was written in an Instagram post during the folklore era, that that was going to be ushering in another surprise album. But I think Taylor feels very much like these two albums are perfect as they are and that she wants to kind of let them be. And to be completely honest with you, this video is going to have some unpopular opinions and uh, I really wanted to be careful about what I was planning on saying about this whole project because I am very, very happy that Taylor is not planning on doing any more surprise releases in the imminent future. Surprised was an understatement uh, for how I felt when this album was announced last week. Uh, you know, as I was so enamored with folklore. I am still not over folklore. You can watch my review of it. I'll link it in the description. You know, I, I'm not the hugest Taylor Swift fan, and I really do need to preface this video by saying that to anyone who is new here. Um, I love some of Taylor's music. I really, really appreciate her songwriting. I think she's got a beautiful voice. Um, but, you know, Taylor's always been an artist that I like to, I like to pay attention to, but I know that not everything she makes is for me. You know, sonically, there's hit or miss moments. And she tends to work with a lot of different, you know, uh, experimental styles of production, especially in more recent projects that don't pay off all the time for me. And unfortunately, I feel like Evermore does not stand, uh, does not hold quite the same candle that Folklore does for me, um, in that I feel that Evermore is sonically a little self-indulgent. It's not necessarily going for the uh, level of refinement in production and in sonic composition that I think she was reaching with folklore. Um, there's still a through line of gorgeous songwriting and gorgeous, you know, heartfelt, emotive composition being concocted. But I feel as though on Evermore, she decided subconsciously or consciously to focus 100% on the lyrics and then sort of just let the melody just sort of fall into place. And there are a few moments where I think that works pretty well. Make no mistake, I really applaud the lyrical content on this project. The songwriting is, is top tier. Um, it's expounding upon the sort of mythical story arc that she is, you know, kind of extrapolating from personal account, but also just made up stories in her head, things her friends have been through, um, her collaborators on this record probably putting an in input. She's just having a really great sort of explorative folky session in the, in the studio when she's making these projects. And it's very heartfelt. And so that beautifully comes across. Um, and I think that I think a lot of Taylor Swift fans will be able to 
solely focus on that element of this project because I feel like this project was made so much so much more for the lyrical content than it was for the sonic content. And I think for a lot of people, the you know genre of music that Taylor is aiming for will really sit at home well with them. This is a much more alternative indie record, even than folklore, I would argue. And that's something I think a lot of people might disagree with. I think folklore was sort of like hinting at this direction because we definitely got a few songs on there. Um, that were in very much the similar vein. But we also had a very strong country Taylor, you know, resurgence on that record. There was also, I think, um, you know, some of the balladry that we have been accustomed to seeing from her, sort of like with these grandiose melancholic melodies. Um, I feel like we were really getting uh, just much more stripped back version of some things we've already come accustomed to expect from epic Taylor Swift songwriting and balladry mixed with really nice acoustic mandolins and, you know, country instrumentals. Um, but unfortunately, she foregoes a lot of that on this record for going with a bit more of a percussive, you know, drum synth combo. Uh, the production on this record is largely put in the hands of Aaron Dresner, who is a frontman for the indie band The National. And of course, he was also working on Folklore with Taylor. I can't recall if he was on more songs on this record than on folklore, but um, he's on a lot of them on this project. Uh, Jack Antonoff is also employed on one song, Gold Rush, um, which is one of the more upbeat songs on this record. And then we also have Bonnie Vare, who is a featured vocalist on the closing track, Evermore, who was also, of course, on folklore. And then, of course, we also have collaboration by the female rock band Haim. Um, and I... Uh, have great things to say about that track, actually. It's one of the highlights for me on this record. Um, but I think that the sound and the chamber pop, indie folk, uh, uh, country tinged aesthetic that she is going for is a very mellow, subdued, understated, you know, uh, murkier sound. Um, and it's also a sound that's a little bit tepid. I hate to say it. There are a lot of songs where I feel like the no construction, the verses, the melodies, she's really not straying much beyond these small ranges of notes. Um, so you get a lot of repetitive melody lines. You get a lot of melodies that don't really stand out upon at least a couple listens. It takes a long time for anything to get lodged into your head. Uh, and I found it really difficult to sort of stay awake for a lot of this project, especially upon first listen. And again, I'm going to get probably a bit of hate for saying that. Um, people are saying that this is Taylor at her most, at her highest craft. And I won't dispute that, but I also feel like there might have been a bit of compromise made in the commercial, the commercial appeal, which is not to say that I want Taylor to make things that can be played on radio. But I feel as though Taylor, like I said, was just not really so wrapped up in trying to create catchy hooks. She was not really so wrapped up in trying to even really have a melody that stuck. And this is going to be the one controversial part of this video that I really needed to get out. And I'm not feeling so strongly this way after repeated listens, but after my first listen, I was definitely feeling this. I was very disappointed to, to find that this project, to me, sounded very rushed. It felt like a lot of these songs were great B-side tracks to folklore. You know, songs you wouldn't put on the standard edition or songs that didn't quite make the final cut. They're just demo reels. Um, the way they sounded just felt incomplete. It felt like there needed to be a little bit more time spent on the melodic composition and on some of the production. Um, I also wished that there was some more flexing of Taylor's vocal abilities. I think she kind of definitely embraces her lower tone and lower register on a lot of these tracks quite beautifully, but there's not a lot that like lets her voice soar above the mix. There's not, like I said, a lot of range in the types of notes she's hitting on this project, which we saw a little bit more of with Folklore, and we were used to seeing with Taylor. So it's just something I miss, and it's something I really liked about her music, I'm not gonna lie. Um, and so I found it a little hard to indistinguish one song from the next, and I started to get fatigued by the overall sound. Granted, it's not 100% my style of music. I'm not familiar with the national sound, but there's a reason why indie alternative rock bands can be very kind of plotting for me and that they do sound very discordant in part. A lot of the time they tend to drag melodically. They tend to not necessarily be so much about 
creating that melody that like catches you instrumentally, which can be a great thing, or it can be, in my opinion, not such a great thing. It's just up to your own taste, um, but to each his own. Uh, so I think that Taylor is definitely leaning into that much more heavily. And I think that over time, there will be more songs that grow on me, but I definitely felt a bit disappointed because I was also a little bit alarmed at how quickly she was turning this project out. Look, these are not just short little projects of maybe like eight or 10 songs. Like these are 15 song albums with bonus tracks. You know, I follow a lot of artists and I talk about them on this channel who I really, really love and adore, female artists predominantly. And the one common thread that a lot of these artists have is that they don't release music very often, um, which may, can be a very frustrating thing as a fan of theirs. I mean, I'm thinking of Imogen Heap, who, you know, hasn't released an album in six years. And I'm thinking, well, look at this decade ahead. Maybe we'll get one Imogen Heap album. <laughs> like, I'm just hoping for that. And also, you know, other artists that I just constantly am expecting this sort of, this more sort of regular schedule of, it takes about three to five years for them to put out another project. That's something I've come to expect with a lot of artists that would con consider themselves artists and not so much people who make music for Spotify or for the charts. Taylor has broken that mold. Ariana Grande also comes to mind, but of course Ari has been unapologetic about saying she wants to drop projects like hotcakes, like the rappers do with the mixtapes. And I think that, you know, as much as she's trying to put her, you know, own craft and blood, sweat, and tears into those projects artistically, I think that there isn't so much of a focus on those projects being, you know, completely interpersonal bearings of her soul, dis you know, disassociated from pop culture and the radio. Whereas Taylor is definitely going in a much more sort of like, well, hey, we're in a pandemic. I've got nothing else to do. So I'm just going to strum my guitar and make up songs and just put them out there. My record label can deal with it. You know, um, I don't care if the radio plays my stuff. I'm not even really worried about singles and all mad props and respect to her for that. I really love that hustle and that mentality that Taylor has. It's really that of an indie artist who also has made a certain level of fame that has the leverage and the ability and privilege to do things like that. Um, and so I love seeing Taylor unashamedly pursue music that way. It's such a fast pace because I really want to disprove the narrative that it has to take years and years and years to make a good song. I've heard a lot of artists say that, you know, it's like, well, that just doesn't happen overnight. But then you also hear other artists talk about how they made this one hit song in 10 minutes. And I'm like, well, did you really make it in 10 minutes? Or was it actually like longer than that? You just did it a lot in the studio at that one particular moment where a lot of it came together. All that being said, unfortunately, I feel like Taylor is not really proving the point with this record for me personally on the sonic side. Um, and I won't harp too much more about it, but I just feel as though this album, if it had been cooked in the oven for a little bit longer, maybe she might have, you know, tweaked some of the melodies or maybe tried to make, I don't know. I think she made it the way she wanted to make it. I'm just saying that like, I just can sense, I can hear the fact not, not a lot of time was meant spent on making these melody structures. I just, melodies, I just can, just, that's just what I picked up on. Um, so, you know, again, you can come at me for all of this. I'm sorry, I just had to voice my opinion on that. It's one of the big things I look for, almost more than lyrics, you know, when I'm talking about music. And of course, I'm going to probably be talking forever about the lyrics on this project because, oh my goodness, I mean, I need to go through the track list. But I'll be honest with you, it's going to be a bit brief for some of the tracks because I just, I need to, you know, watch this, how long I could just go on and on about this. The lead single, Willow has the music video. It's a bit witchy. She goes into the woods. Um, there's actually a witchy version, which I have not heard as of filming this video. Aaron Dresner produced this track. Um, and when we start out with this very folksy guitar looping instrumental, I mean, my ears instantly perk up. I mean, this is exactly what I expected to hear coming off of Folklore. And you know, the melody of this song is is very whimsical. It's very wrapped up in sort of the icy branches, uh, the willowy, uh, the willowy branches that she sings about as a metaphor. Life was a willow and it bent right to your wind. Head on the pillow, I could feel you sneaking in as if you were a mythical, mythical thing. Like you were a trophy or a champion ring and there was one prize I cheat to win. She describes it as sounding like casting a spell to make somebody fall in love with you. There is something 
enchanted about the melody of this song and and the uh, understated, enraptured uh, kind of vibe. Um, it's possibly my favorite song on the record, um, just because I, I just love the earthy instrumental. I love the blusteriness of it. I just, you know, I think Taylor's vocals are just, it's introducing us to the understated lower register tone that we hear for a lot of this song, but we still get some of that higher tone um, coming through. But it's like hushed vocals. It's not belting. There's uh, there's very little chest voice, I mean, on this record, you know, unless she's low. Um, and it's, so it's, it's, it's a softer head voice that she's using. Champagne Problems. Katy Perry also had a song of this name on her latest album, which I thought was kind of interesting. The piano, very alluring on this track. Um, and also, again, a very pleasing melody that I think is growing on me with more listens. I think this was one of those tracks where I needed to bookmark it and say, you know what, maybe I didn't feel it initially on first listen, but come back to it because there's just something here that it's not quite pop, but it's also not quite in the sort of alternative chamber pop you know, folk direction that she goes in a lot of these other tracks. A lot of these songs have a little bit of a tis the season vibe, hinting at another upcoming track. Uh, this song has also got a bit of a Christmas theme in the story of it, she says, telling the story of a girl rejecting a proposal from a potential fiance right before Christmas. So uh, there's a little bit of a, uh, oops, I'm sorry, I just broke your heart. Uh, your heart was glass, I dropped it, champagne problems. You're, you told your family for a reason, you couldn't keep it in. Your sister splashed out the bo splashed out on the bottle, now no one's celebrating. And that would be quite a glum holiday, I've got to be honest with you. Um, so I think that Taylor has a knack for inviting a vibe that, you know, can be a little uncomfortable uh, in a setting, in a situation that is not necessarily favorable, but she creates a charm around it that makes you kind of forget that she's singing about something that's really heartbreaking um, because there's just something so at home about the melody of this track. Gold Rush is one of the few up-tempo tracks on this record. I could see this being a single and it's the only song that Jack Antonoff had a hand in. I can really relate to what she's saying this, the lyrics are about of this uh, being attracted to someone that everyone else is as well, basically having a sort of crush that's kind of universal. Um, and realizing you've got to stop daydreaming about this person. It's not going to end well. Um, catching yourself when you find yourself repeatedly imagining this person. The tempo switch up was really unexpected for me. You know, in the intro, it's so lofty and sort of esoteric and like the drawn out, gleaming, twinkling, eyes like sinking ships on water. So inviting, I almost jump in. And then it's like our pace, our pulse rapidly quickens as she sings, but I don't like a gold rush. I don't like anticipating my face in a red flush. I don't like that anyone would die to feel your touch. Everybody wants you. You know, she's rapid fire going through these emotions that are, you can tell like this kind of pent up giddy kind of frustrated uh, romantic feelings. And you can tell that there's just a lot boiling under the surface, which I like about this track. Though melodically, it still leaves a little bit to be desired for me. Um, it's a solid enough track. So this is going to be a real unpopular opinion. Um, Tis the Damn Season is not doing anything for me um, sonically. We've got, you know, a more kind of alternative indie rock acoustic guitar line with the drums. And the melody just never takes off. You know, it's, it's a, like I said, a very small range of notes. And honestly, there's a bit of moments where the discordant nature of the instrumentation just really comes to fore for me because I don't feel like her voice and the instrumentals are always in tune with, with one another. Um, and again, that's something I tend to notice in like indie alt rock a lot. And uh, I guess to each his own, some people like that, but I don't know. I know I'm being, you know, negative Nancy about some of these songs, but um now, of course, on like her previous record, we have these characters she's invented. One of them is Dorothea. Um, this song is supposed to be about her uh, and coming back home for the holidays, presumably to Hollywood and rediscovering an old flame. And I'm staying at my parents' house and the road not taken looks real good now. Time flies, messy as the mud on your truck tires. Now I'm missing your smile. Hear me out. We could just ride around and the road not taken looks real good now, and it always leads to you and my hometown. A classic winter break love story, rekindled. That's what I get from this track, and unfortunately with the instrumental, I don't really get anything earthy or homely about it. 
to me personally, the melody and the, you know, the, um, more importantly, the instrumentation is just lacking a little bit of that, you know, fireside charm that I think Champagne Problems has a bit more of that helps kind of bring you into the overarching story that she's telling. Um, and that's, this is all Aaron Dres, this is all Aaron Desner. It's Desner, not Dresner. I'm sorry. This is all Aaron Desner's fault because, uh, yeah, I hate to say, it, I don't know if I'm the biggest Aaron Desner fan. I just, you're all over this one. Another track. And this is track five too, right? Taylor Swift fans know that track five is like a hollowed space on her records. Tolerate it. Well, I'm unfortunately going to say this. I do not tolerate this song. Point blank and the period. We've got a very pensive, dull piano. Um, then there's a little bit of a, you know, uh, clipping beat that's very subtle in the mix, uh, very subtle in the mix in the synth backing. And then, you know, Taylor's vocals are doing a lot, but nothing is really hitting the mark for me. Like I said, it starts out pensive, then it gets a little bit more angsty. I just, I, it just, just misses the mark for me. I just, I don't feel anything from this song. And it's unfortunate because it really just, does a disservice to the lyrics because I know that the lyrics are, are, are pretty strong. Singing about pouring yourself into someone, you know, uh, who is obviously not reciprocating. I wait by the door like I'm just a kid, use my best colors for your portrait, lay the table with the fancy shit, and watch you tolerate it. If it's all in my head, tell me now. Tell me I've got it wrong somehow. I know my love should be celebrated, but you tolerate it. I want you to do more than just tolerate it. I want you to appreciate and like take the time to notice that I'm doing a lot of things for you. There's that frustration coming through. I mean, you can sense that in the melody and in the chorus. One could argue that the tumultuous nature of the song fits the theme. Again, I'm not going to argue there, but um, the, the melody just sounds like it was a one track improvised thing and it stuck. Track six, the Haim collaboration, No Body, No Crime. The one song that has that really ear-pleasing melody to it. Um, it's got a real hook, guys. We've got a hook on this album. Isn't that something? This song is actually, I think, quite humorous to me. I mean, this is Taylor going to a level of fictionalized songwriting that I think was always inevitable. Um, Taylor talks about how she listens to a lot of true, true crime podcasts. They're very popular, I've heard. Um, where you're trying to guess who done it in these like unsolved mysteries. And um, Taylor is using the name Este, who apparently is one of the band members of, of Haim, is named Esti. I guess it's Esti, not Este. Um, I've never heard that name. It's quite interesting. Um, and is a good friend of hers. And so she places her in the center of a missing person case, um, which follows being cheated on by that person, by Esti's husband. I think he did it, but I just can't prove it. No body, no crime, but I ain't letting up until the day I die. The combination of the, the guitars, the country feel, you know, I mean, this, this, the piano that is still on this track, I mean, it, it just, it all fits perfectly and it fits perfectly with the layered vocals. I do, I do believe we do get some vocals from Haim in there. I know that Haim vocals, uh, vocalizes some spoken word at the points that uh, Danielle, who's the other sister, um, and it just, everything just kind of moves and has a momentum to it, which is really refreshing when we're at this point of the record. So track number seven, I think would have been a better fit for track number five. If we're talking about a song that has gut-wrenching emotional weight, it's track seven, Happiness. Now, I wouldn't say that Happiness has the most ear-catching melody by any means. Um, it's a bit placid, but there's something about the focus on just her vocals. We have a very melancholic piano movement going on with just a few notes um, and then some synth reverb kind of spacey instrumentation that really puts the mood into this kind of hazy dreamlike sequence uh, that feels very cathartic. It feels very um, liminal. And I think that the lyrical content might be some of the most superb that I think she's reached ever. There'll be happiness after you, but there was happiness because of you. Both of these things can be true. This is happiness. Finding hope in a decaying and, you know, dead relationship, looking back at the memories and realizing that the glimmers of happiness that came through out of that are still worth just cherished, just because, you know, despite the fact that so much of it seemed to be going in a negative direction, 
is a very wise way at looking at, you know, uh, and recycling, as I like to call it, happiness or memories that can still be used to make you feel better about what could be coming down the pike for you romantically, instead of just being bitter and also letting that, you know, close you off to feeling love ever again, feeling like, you know, this situation broke you. So every situation that's to come is going to have to be the same. Trying to break from that negative cycle of thinking. Apparently, this is the most recent track she finished for this record. You know, a week before this album was released, this song was finished. Uh, so this gives some of my favorite artists who, you know, who let songs sit on the shelf for up to a year before they put them out. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe you can just put stuff out when you make it. You know, you can feed us. But all right, we'll take our time. We'll let things sit on shelves. Taylor doesn't like to do that, which I appreciate. Dorothea. I want to like this song so much, but I'm sorry, there's just nothing about the melody of this song that is exemplary or spec. I, I, the, the, it's got that sing-songy girl next door, you know, a bit of old Taylor coming through with the instrumental, and I appreciate that, um, but the, the melody just feels so half-baked. I feel like she could do so much more with the range or where she was taking this song um, Dorothy, uh, I, I don't know how I feel about the way she intonates that line. Um, it just, the note structure just does not, it's not what you would expect. And a lot of that is what this album is. I mean, like I said, it's a very experimental project. Sometimes it pays off, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, a lot of people would probably say that this is the, like, male perspective of Tis the Damn Season. So this is singing from the guy, I don't know who the guy is. Dorothea is the guy, the girl that this guy is pining for. Um, Coney Island. This song actually features um, some vocals. Listener of the National. Oh boy. This is a very stark track. Um, there's this one repetitive note structure that she kind of repeats all of her lines with. Um, and I, I just, I just got to be honest, this is a perfect example of a song that I just completely tuned out of because of it. It sounded like it was a bit on autopilot and like they'd forgotten to actually be working on a song. Um, unfortunately, again, I feel like a lot of the lyrics are lost in the half-baked production and the half-baked melody structure. So I really would love to read these lyrics as poetry on their own. And I think that that's something that, you know, I'm not saying Taylor should start making poetry books, but I'm just saying that like, I really don't want people to come for me for like discrediting the artistry behind these songs because there is such artistry, but the sonic and uh, musical elements just aren't all adding up for me on these tracks, but the lyrics deserve much better. I'm not really entirely sure though what she's singing about. I mean, there's a lot of disparate images of Coney Island, you know, um, nostalgic musings about a relationship. And unfortunately, like, it just makes me not that invited into it because I don't feel like the vocal performances or the melody or the instrumentation wants to get me soaked up into it. It just wants to make me tuned out. Um, so I have a really hard time getting into the sonic, I mean, into the story arc, even though this is one of the wordier songs on this record and one of the longer ones. So track number 10, Ivy. Oh, this song comes so close to greatness for me. So close to greatness. We've got and you know ambient acoustic country instrumental that's building up steam um we've got such vivid poetic imagery in the lyrical content how's one to know i'd meet you where the spirit meets the bones in a faith forgotten land in from the snow your touch brought forth an incandescent glow tarnished but so grand and the old widow goes to the stone every day but i don't i just sit here and wait grieving for the living Oh, God damn, my pain fits in the palm of your freezing hand, taking mine, but it's promised to another. Oh, I can't stop you putting roots in my dreamland, my house of stone, your ivy grows, and now I'm covered in you. I mean, it's just such a beautiful way of describing the wreckage of a broken relationship. The moodiness, you know, the brooding resentment, the kind of like a bit of a tinge of despair cast over the whole thing, yet with a hopeful tinge, you know, I think there's a bit of a more positive and optimistic sound in the melody construction. So you can tell that there's a real catharsis 
to the delivery of this track. And so it's a track I'm ultimately a bit ambivalent on, um, but I really appreciate and I really think will grow on me more over time. It's one I want to definitely keep listening to. Um, it fits the overall vibe of other tracks that I really liked off of Folklore. Like it's a little bit more in the vein of songs like Mirror Ball. Um, and so I'm just, I'm very kind of in, I'm, I'm here for this sort of like kind of moody, subdued, melancholic stuff that she, she's like poetic stuff. Very poetic. Cowboy Like Me. Um, this is another skip for me. I'm sorry. This has a real country bar sound to it. Definitely feels a bit more live so you could see it on stage. Marcus Mumford of Mumford and Sons actually joins her on backing vocals, which is really cool to see as a collaboration. Um, you know, I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm a big fan of this one, um, but I do want to give it more time. Uh, I feel like it's only fair. I've got some tricks up my sleeve. Takes one to know one. You're a cowboy like me. Musing on, as she sings in the bridge, the skeletons in both of their closets. Maybe they're a perfect match for each other in their imperfect selves. They're swindling past, past ways. Up tempo again, which, you know, breaks a little bit of the monotony of some of these tracks. Um, long story short, it's interesting that Taylor is still going back to talking about the 2016 drama. Um, I tried to pick my battles till the battle picked me misery. Like the war of words, I shouted in my sleep. And I fell from the pedestal right down the rabbit hole. Long story short, it was a bad, bad time. A lot of people say that this is probably the most reputation sounding song from this record, not just in terms of the lyrical content, but also in terms of the popular instrumentation and of course the up-tempo um, melody, which, you know, I'll give it credit for being a little bit more memorable for that reason. Um, this was a song that, you know, I think it just by nature will perk your ears up, but then after a while, you still don't really feel like the melody is leaving a lot to be desired. I'll just say I'll appreciate it for what it is, but it's just, again, not a song that really stands out for me. Um, track number 13, Marjorie. I think I've been debating on what my favorite song on this record is, and I think that as of filming this video, Marjorie takes the cake. Um, it's a bit of a grower, but I think that the understated elegance of this track is just mind-blowing. I think that the obviously the subject matter is so heartwarming. She's singing about Marjorie Finlay, who is her grandmother, who passed away in 2003. And so if you look at the lyric video, which is the first time I heard this song, you know, you're seeing these images of her as a younger woman. And it's such a nostalgic, beautiful tribute to a family member. Um, but it's so much more than that. And I think that's what makes Taylor's songwriting so gifted is that I feel like when there's a good collaboration of melody and with instrumental and vocal, and of course, uh, lyrics, there there's can be something very transcendent that happens. And Marjorie is, without being all in your face with the melody, so much getting under your skin. It's one of the songs where I just, I feel like more time was taken to craft it to the, be, the best it could be. And in the pre-chorus and like, and she's reaching up and if I didn't know better, I think you were talking to me. Like it just talking to me now, like it, it just, I feel such emotion. What died didn't stay dead. As much as I don't love the monotony of that chorus, I think actually her repeating it like a mantra in this instance with a very little melodic change is very important um, because I think this song in many ways is like a mantra. It's an affirmation um, to remember the warmth from the person who touched you at such an early age. Um, and of course that opening lyric, which I mean, I could see being in a cross stitch like over my living room, never be so kind, you forget to be clever. Never be so clever, you forget to be kind. I don't know if Taylor came up with that herself, but bravo, one of my favorite lyrics on this record for sure. Um, you know, she has another one that's similar about power and politeness and, just flipping that on its script and, you know, a tribute to a grandmother who, you know, kind of reminds me of my own late grandmother. Well, I have one who's alive still and one who's passed. And it reminds me of both of them in a way. And um, I find that just very endearing. So we have this, yeah, sputtering instrumental on the track uh, 14, Closure, um, and then a piano melody that wants to take off. But again, I don't think it leaves the runway. Um, Taylor's working her working her stuff around it, but it doesn't nothing clicks for me. 
um, which is again a theme on this record. Uh, closure lyrically, I'll be honest, this is a song I've listened to only like once. So I'm like trying to just like reacquaint myself with it. Um, how could an ex not understand why I'm still mad at them? It seems to be the theme in which she's pondering. It cut deep to know you, right to the bone. Yes, I got your letter. Yes, I'm doing better. I know that it's over. I don't need your closure. It's bruising your ego to know that I'm actually still mad at you. I'm not going to, you know, so easily forgive you for what you did. Like I know most, most people probably do. And, you know, you're not accustomed to that. Yeah, people, I don't know. I don't, I just don't see it. I just don't see it. It's not my genre. It's not my, my thing. It's, it's a melodic. It's, it's just going in too many different directions. All right, the closing track, the actual closure of this record. I'm sorry, I'm only doing the standard. I've only got time for that. Evermore. It really pains me to say that I want to love this track so, so much. But it, the missing link for me is Bonnie Vare's vocals. And I'll get to that. Because this melancholic, mournful piano chord that she is that moves throughout the piece very repetitively but i wouldn't argue in a you know um displeasing way it's it's so somber and it's so meditative that it really pulls you in and like i said it makes the lyrics very center stage i really love that i love that she's just very neatly following the melody line with these very cutting deeply personal aching lyrics that are as wistful and melancholic as ever, as we've heard from her. Gray November, I've been down since July. Motion capture, put me in a bad light. Put, uh, I replay my footsteps on each stepping stone, trying to find the one where I went wrong, writing letters addressed to the fire. And I was catching my breath, staring out an open window, catching my death. And I couldn't be sure. I had a feeling so peculiar that this pain would be forevermore. So Taylor is most candidly, I think, ever that she ever has singing about personal issues with mental health and depression. So we have Justin Vernon coming in with this time a very lofty falsetto. Uh, if we recall on Exile, he came in with those that deep, deep voice of his. Oh boy. Well, I'm afraid, Justin, you can't win with me because I, I, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. This, this really ruins the vibe for me. I'm, it's just like, please, please stay off the song. I'm sorry. I just can't abide his shouty, raspy high vocals that are not really on key. They're not really trying to be on key. They're not even really trying to match Taylor's. They're just there. He's not a singer, you know? I know he thinks of himself as one. I'm sorry, Justin, I'm really going into you here. You are probably a phenomenal songwriter and instrumentalist, but your vocals, dude, oh my God, just, I wish some people knew that they just don't have it. And a lot of, this is the, this is a gripe I have with so many alternative indie, indie bands like Bon Iver is that they don't care that they sound terrible when they sing. They really don't. And it's made it so hard for me to get into so many bands that like a lot of my hipster friends love or are into. And I'm just like, but can you stomach their vocals though? Like, can you really stomach their vocals? So I, it's really sad because it brings a frantic, you know, uh, back and forth that I know Taylor wanted for this song. Um, and it's, you know, it's just sort of like this moment of crescendo. And then we come back down and we end with just her and the key and the piano again, which I'm glad, but it's a part I could just snip out and just be happy with what we're left with. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I just, I've said my piece. I'm sorry. I live with it. I know I'm not alone with that. I've seen some people, um, pointing out the, you know, um, slightly cringy vocals that are on display there. But, you know, Taylor, all in all, I applaud you for being so invested in telling raw, authentic stories, even if they're fictional. Um, I applaud you for, you know, being extremely vulnerable with your pen and crafting such great poetry. I can tell there's some Lana Del Rey influence as there was on folklore. Um, I do, you know, of course lament the fact that I do, like I said, feel like the instrumentals, uh, Aaron Desner's, 
you know, guitars and production. It just, it's so stagnant in so many places. And I feel like it's not allowing much to happen vocally or melodically within the songs. And that's just unfortunate. But again, that's just the vibe they're going for. It's, it's a vibe and it fits sometimes, but 15 songs over an hour, you gotta, t I gotta be honest with you. It was putting me, it was putting me out. I was just, I was like so tuned out. And so I have to listen to a lot of these songs like isolated because all together, it's just way too much. I'm sorry. It's just way too much grayscale. Um, it's not a lot going on, um, melodically and that will make me sound like someone who's just like, I want my pop beats, but it's, there's something to be said about the musicality. There's something to be said about the range, the dynamics, the movement, the key changes, the modulations. Those things are just not present on this album. And if they are, they're in spare moments. And, um, even the instrumentation, like none of it really comes through. It's a, kind of muted in the background except for a couple moments. Um, so yeah, okay, I've done enough critiquing on that front. What do you think of this record? Do you think it is better than folklore? Or are you of my opinion? Nothing can touch folklore. Folklore is still, I think, one of the best albums Taylor has ever made, even though there are a couple songs in that record I'm sort of eh on. This album, I've got to be honest with you, there's only about six songs that I actually find replay factor for, maybe seven, um, because uh, champagne problems is kind of like it's trying to get there. The other six I'm really into. I mean, like I said, Willow and Marjorie are tied for first place. No body, no crime. Um, you know, it's not so weighty and symbolic of a song. I just really appreciate it. It's a really great vibe, especially for the car. Um, I really appreciate Ivy, happiness. Oh my goodness, happiness. There's a real cerebral you know, uh, meditative quality to that song, I cannot deny. Um, and uh, the other song, Gold Rush, I would shout that one out as well as this, the other one. Um, it's just, it's it's an interesting song that keeps you on your toes. Um, but yeah, oh boy, it leaves a lot to be desired, which is a bit unfortunate, but I'm also happy that we got Folklore and it was such a grand magnum opus. And um, Evermore feels a bit like Leftovers. Sorry to say it. I know a lot of Taylor Swift fans will disagree. Um, and the critics are really enjoying this project. Um, that's not surprising to me. I feel like critics often, you know, especially when it comes to this sort of indie folk style, the musicality elements, um, I don't know, it's just a matter of taste. It's just not that important to them. The artistry is there. I'm not going to deny it. The artistry is there. The talent is there. I do want Taylor to slow it down. I hate saying that, but I just think, I think a lot of Taylor Swift fans agree that like, there comes a point where you become overplayed and a bit overdone. Um, and I do think that me personally, I'm getting a little tired of Taylor Swift. She has, for better or for worse, put out nearly four albums in the last almost four years. So it's it's been a lot of Taylor, you know, especially with her last two, you know, Lover coming only a year before Folklore and now only five months to this. Uh, so, and I do also lament the fact that her rushing through these eras makes the songs and the era itself feel less memorable. Um, and so there's something about an artist taking a little bit more time away and sort of like hibernating. And then there's this building and rumbling of them returning. And then it's this euphoric kind of like, here I am. And you kind of rediscover them again. I like that cycle and rhythm of, you know, hibernating and then, you know, uh, performing and hibernating and performing. And I feel like when an artist just is on, on, on and putting out music constantly, it breaks from that and you get fatigue. And I could see myself easily getting Taylor Swift fatigue, especially since these are long projects. So um, yeah, I think she's given us plenty. Uh, she's given us more uh, albums this year, uh, US government pandemic stimulus checks. So uh, props to her for that, but that's pretty damn sad. Um, and uh, I will just leave it at that. I hope you all enjoyed this review. I hope that you didn't find my criticism too hard to bear. Um, again, it's just Taylor's always been, you know, an artist I appreciate and I look like I look forward to listening to her stuff. I've got my favorite songs, but am I a Taylor Swift stan by any means? No, I am not. Um, so just take that with a pinch of salt. Um, and I will let me know in the comments what your favorite songs are. And like I said, my review of Folklore will be in the description, as well as probably my review of Lover and probably other reviews I've done of her albums. I'll do it all in the link. It'll all be in the description if you're interested. 
All right, boy, this was a long one. Well, I will see you all in my next video. I hope you all have a wonderful, blessed holiday this season, and I will see you all next time. Peace, love, and light. Bye.